Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of BrillMedia.co and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today, our guest is Adam Shlomi, founder of SoFlow SAT Tutoring. Uh, what's going on, everyone? <laughs> nice to meet you, Adam. So you have a fantastic story. Um, you started your tutor. You're you're uh, you're out of college a few years. Tell me about your your entrepreneurial like spirits. I mean, this is the second company you've started, um, or you you've been a part of that in an entrepreneurial capacity. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I started SoFlow when I was a junior at Georgetown. I had shattered my ankle pretty badly, and so I had to take a semester off of school move back in with my parents and have all these surgeries. Doctor said I may never walk again. And while that was happening, um, I was already really interested in entrepreneurship at this point. So I was sort of was exploring a few different projects. Uh, one of them was like importing headphones from China and selling them on Amazon. Uh, one of them was uh, like a car washing business. And then this sort of was the project that ended up going the farthest. Um, I started by just building a website online um, at the start of January, 2019. And then seeing how many customers we could attract, how we could attract local in-person SAT tutoring customers. Eventually, word spread about the good work that we were doing, and we started scaling up a little bit and moving more towards online. We started getting more and more requests from people around the country for online SAT prep. Um, And so I started hiring people that I found on Indeed, really going through resumes, training people well to sort of copy the system that I had built for my students. Um, Right now, we have about 70 tutors on the team. Um, November was our best month ever. We signed up 120 students in one month for sort of a one-on-one tutoring in an agency model. Um, and the future is bright. 2021 is sort of the same problems as 2020. How can we get SoFlow in front of more people? Uh, because we think we have a really strong product offering. Customers really love us. And now scaling that up by attracting more customers, um, that's, a, that's really the biggest challenge that we're going to be facing in 2021. That's incredible. So, what what do you think was a, 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 is is the reason for your big growth in November? So, twenty twenty overall was sort of a growth year for us. We we six x year over year from twenty nineteen. Um, I think two things did really well for us. One is sort of this commitment to excellence and having a quality offering, only hiring great tutors, having friendly cust- customer friendly pricing, um, being good on the sales calls and on the phone, and sort of all those things that every business owner aspires with business excellence. Um, But you only have so much control over that. I think the second thing that was sort of a blessing for us was COVID. We were an online first tutoring company by that point. And COVID sort of had the fastest transition to digital in human history. So normally our number one reason someone wouldn't choose to work with us is they wanted an in-person or local option. Um, And then after COVID, that excuse kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, and even recently, I was sort of, uh, I asked parents to fill out a feedback form. And one of the questions we asked was, why did you choose SoFlow? Go back to that time period and remember sort of your customer journey. And generally reviews were mentioned a lot. Pricing was mentioned a lot. But one thing that I didn't expect was how many customers said it was the middle of the pandemic. There was no in-person options and you seemed like a good online option. So it's like the psychology had changed basically. So- yeah, I think became a lot more accepting of these online options. That's incredible. So when did you, when March rolled around and, and, and the world sort of seemed to take a big screeching halt, did you start doing anything differently in your sales process or your marketing? Like, tell us about the decision-making at, around that point in time. March was really scary, actually. So March was the worst month we ever had. Um, we went from doing, we went from signing up maybe 50, 60 students a month to signing up, I think we signed up 20 students in the month of March. Um, All the SATs had been canceled. A lot of colleges were starting to go test optional. And I thought, wow, I am really gonna be in a a bad situation here because one, all of my competitors are gonna go online. And so this advantage that we have of being an online company is gonna be eliminated. And two, the SAT is gonna go test optional and a lot of colleges are gonna waive it. So demand is gonna really reduce and supply is gonna get more competitive. and I was home, like by that point, so I was actually a senior in college at that point. I had left Georgetown. They had kicked me out of my, I was living in the entrepreneur's house at Georgetown. Okay. They kicked me out. 
Um, and so I was back home for two months, really with nothing to do besides watch TV or work on my or work on SoFlow. And so it was a really exciting time because we started pivoting to new things. Like we started doing TikTok influencers to see how that would work and trying to open up new digital channels. But there was this point where I was really afraid that everything was going to collapse and this business that I worked really hard on for the last 15 months was, was going to end. Um, and then I think the opposite happened, which was that because we were an online first company, sort of the internet was our home field. And so other companies were trying to move to digital while we had been working out those kinks for the last year. And so once sort of the economy opened up a little bit and people started looking out uh, and people sort of started searching SAT tutoring again and started looking in the market, we were one of the first places they called and we were already set up to handle that online demand. So we were able to ride this wave and catch this demand for online tutoring services. That was really exciting. So, so tell us a little bit about your SEO efforts. I imagine if people are finding you through organic search or, or other marketing activities, your SEO was already in place to capitalize yeah. this shift. I think this isn't a good example of sort of, we were ahead of the curve on things that mattered. So like if you search Zoom SAT Tutor, we were one of the first results. And that was six months before COVID. I was really fighting hard to get that word. I remember like overcoming it on the day that we became number one for Skype SAT Tutor, the day we became number one for Zoom SAT Tutor. So these sort of online platforms like SAT Tutor, SAT Prep, weren't super competitive at the time. Um, and so we had sort of been laying the groundwork to hit there first. And then it's sort of like I took SoFlo as an opportunity to try and learn a lot about sort of different things. So it's like, here's how to learn how to build a website. Here's how to learn to do PR and outreach to people. Here's how to learn how to do on-page SEO. And sort of these are industry standards. And I'm not an expert by any means, but it was a really good opportunity to learn how to at least do, you know, competitive work at a reasonable level. And so I focused on on-page optimization for our homepage so that not just blogs, but our homepage would be one of the top results for Zoom SAT prep, Skype SAT prep virtual SAT prep. Hopefully one day we'll get online SAT prep. That's the battle right now. Okay. So earlier this year or last year, you're about a year ago, then you're looking at really effective SEO strategies, probably more than 12 months ago, considering what you just said. It takes like six six months sometimes for SEO to kind of like really kick in and, and show yeah. the course. You, have you maintained that focus on SEO? Are you writing content? Are you putting out videos, like tell me about, does that kind of wane a little bit and you focus on other things like Facebook and TikTok influencers? It would definitely wane. So I would say like, we'll generally try out something, see if we start getting results within a month. If we do, awesome, let's double down on that. If we say like, hey, this isn't working out well, then we'll move on to try and find new client funnels. So we did SEO for a little while and then said, hey, it's a really competitive niche. It's expensive to produce content. And we think there's better ways to reach customers because it's unlikely that we're ever going to be a top three result for some of these really competitive search terms. It's and a so long process. Is, it is a long process. It's it's really, and we want, you know, I'm an impatient person. I wanted faster results. Um, and so then we started switching to other things, whether that was YouTube influencers, we reached out to a bunch of them and had about 70 influencers working with us. Um, TikTok influencers, we had someone who had over 500,000 followers, really like espousing SoFlo on, on her feed. But we saw that parents are really the people who matter. And so the more that we can get parents on our team, the better we're going to be. And so we actually sort of pivoted away from the influencers who are more focused on students. And now we're going back to content writing and, and video production. So something that we're launching this week, actually, is we're going to start doing free video explanations of every question on the SAT. So there's a few companies that have these explanations behind a paywall. We think that if we can make them free, one, we'll be able to have out people who are studying on their own. And two, we'll be able to drive a lot of traffic to the website from high intent people who are already studying for the test and looking for the best resources. Are you doing that? And that's an SEO, that's an SEO tactic. Yeah. So the idea is like, let's say you search up, I remember being a tutor and I would search up the particular question that I had that I couldn't figure out how to do on my own. Uh, maybe you'll find like a PDF explanation that was released by College Board like seven years ago that like six different companies have on their site, or you'll find like a Yahoo Answers style forum post, but that's really the only content out there. And so I think we have a real exciting chance to 10X content um, by making video content that is professional and well-produced um, with an expert tutor who's really explaining step-by-step -step how to get to these right answers. And so does, so is that gonna be, you said that's videos, yes? Yeah, so it'll be mostly video, but it'll be in blog form. So there'll be some text um 
with you know with Google algorithms, you don't know, but we're hoping that with we'll have enough text to rank for these search terms. And how important is YouTube in this? I imagine for video, YouTube is going to be much more important. But up until now, have you done anything like has YouTube been a valuable resource for you, or how, how do you? So I've tried to go on the places where I really like being. So like Craigslist was like one of the first places we started getting customers, just to like prove concept in the beginning. Um, I had spent time on Reddit, so we advertised on Reddit. Uh, like Facebook was one that was big for us. I never spent a ton of time on YouTube compared to a lot of other people. I'm not. I generally prefer reading as opposed to video. So it wasn't my first, like, we're going to go after YouTube before everything else. But we're actually, I just hired a YouTube ads agency this week. And so January 4th, January 4th the first Monday of January, we're going to launch some YouTube ads. Um, and I think that has potential to be a really good source of paid ad traffic for us. Um, now it's about, like, doing the hard work, competitor research, figuring out creative strategy, um, and doing everything we can to position those ads to be successful. I imagine Facebook has been a good platform. It's it's a good platform for a lot of companies. Have you been able to mine it and drive? What do you look for generally? Leads or are you trying to get sales off the off the? We're air? trying to get lead. Uh, generally, it's like because you're buying a person and you're not sort of buying an online course. Um, most people have questions, and so they'll sign up and then have like a ten to twenty minute phone call. So we're driving leads off of Facebook. Um, Facebook has been nice for us and that we've been able to prove that we can generate customers with paid ads and that's scalable and that's growth. Uh, unfortunately, sort of because pay Facebook's a little bit more passive, the people who have found us beforehand are actively searching for an SAT tutor and we're one of the first results that comes up. And that's fantastic. The people who are on Facebook are sort of casually browsing and then maybe they get the impulse purchase for an SAT tutor. One of the differentiators that we have is there are no contracts with us. So if you like us, you'll use us. If we're not the right fit, you're not making any long-term commitments. And so for families who are actively scouting the best SAT tutor, this is a great option because they're going to go out and, and really commit to our work and, and, be, and be happy to use us. For Facebook customers who are a bit more impulsive, this isn't a great option because they sort of bought it on a whim. After three weeks, they tally off. And then the student doesn't really get a big benefit because we didn't have time to sort of delve into the program. And we sort of dealt with a customer who wasn't committed to us. Um, and kind of took up resources that could have gone elsewhere. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's like there's there's definitely a lot more nurture that needs to happen inside inside of Facebook. That's that's generally what we find for our, for our clients. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think we sort of have this question now, of how do we build trust from someone who's already filled out the interest form to get on the phone with us and be happy to work with us um, and nurturing those leads so that we get the right leads coming towards us. It's a lot of remarketing. It has to be a lot of remarketing and a lot of different messages in that remarketing in that remarketing story. That's that's the big thing that I think a lot of people miss is that like when someone expresses their interest on Facebook or TikTok, it's because there's something there, but they're probably not ready to purchase. Making them ready to purchase requires a few extra steps that people often miss. Yeah, I think this is a lesson that I learned the hard way, right? Like, I'm going to be learning a lot of lessons you learn from your mistakes. But our biggest sort of image that worked really well was a good scroll stopper. And so we tried using the scroll stopper also on retargeting. And people who are already familiar with us probably need to hear more about the product and the service and the story, um, and much less about just capturing their attention for a brief 10 second period. Right, because you're selling, you, exactly, you're selling them, you're selling them on, on you and and your story and the opportunities that you provide. I imagine it's a competitive space, especially when you look at a local a lo local landscape, there's probably a number of tutoring companies that any one person can choose from. And the loudest, you have to prove your worth every kind of, every step of the way, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, I was listening to the, this guy, Ben Weiss, he's the founder of Buy Brands, B-A-I, it's like a beverage drink. Okay. Uh, and they sold it recently for like $2 billion to Dr. Pepper. And he says he won because he outloved the competition and they, they worked harder than everyone else. And so it's like, I think that was really one of the things that made Salesforce successful. There's a lot of competition, but a lot of the competition doesn't want to get on the phone at 1130 at night with a customer from Hawaii. They don't want to do all of the little things and push that. I, I think we worked harder and, out, and wanted to love and win more than other companies did. But how do we get that message across to the people on Facebook who are casually browsing? Are you the primary driver of marketing activity for the company? So I think there's this transition period where like in the beginning, it was a lot of what I was thinking about, a lot of sort of the customer process that my mom went through when she bought my SAT tutoring. I worked at a tutoring company in high school, so I kind of had seen that sales cycle before. 
but I think I'm sort of capping out at what I can do really well. And now it's a question of like finding other people who I can sort of have ideas and strategy and they can execute more, especially also because like I, uh, the operations day to day is run by a sales manager who does a great job. She does sales, she handles the tutors. And so now I'm focused more on growth. And I think marketing is probably the key driver of growth. Um, when you get a lead in and who's the person who's, who's ultimately talking to the, probably the parent who's talking to the parent or the, or the student, is it you? So in the beginning, it was me all the time. I was handling every single sales call. Um, and then I think there was, I was speaking with this guy, John Root, who sold the company next step MCAT prep. They did similar to what we did, but for the MCAT. And he said, Hey, look, congratulations. You've gone somewhere. You're not, you have you don't have nothing. That's awesome, man. Go, go hire someone, go hire someone tomorrow. Um, because you're only going to get busier. And if you're doing every single day to day activity and you don't have time to start working on projects until 11 o'clock at night, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, so then that week I made a job posting. I interviewed a bunch of people from local, like existing tutoring companies, but I'm pretty young and I wanted to hire someone who sort of had the energy and the ambition that I had. Um, and not someone who was sort of in tutoring because it was a career that they knew and it was the only industry that they had. So I, actually, one of my good friends from college who works at Boston Consulting Group, he, one of his closest friends applied for the job pretty early on. And I was like, and we spoke on the phone. I really liked her. She went through sort of three or four. She went through two interviews, then two tests. Um, and now she runs the day-to-day -day operations, Christina Meyer. And I, told, I was telling my friends earlier, the best decision I've made in the last six months is hiring her. And that's the most success. That's, I think, the biggest successful project we've had. Hmm. And so uh, as you've grown your company, what are the, what are, I, I, pr I presume the majority of the people in your company are, are tutors. Mm -hmm. they're, the, they're the product that you're selling it, as it were, but what, from, from an operational perspective, what other roles did you hire for? What were your second and third and fourth yeah. roles? So for? my second employee is Zapier. Uh, I've tried to automate <laughs> as many things as possible. That's great. Um, and I think this idea, like I hired someone, I we, like used to be billing, billing and payments was sort of a, a hassle and like sending out these emails for students who sign up for the diagnostic test and customer onboarding. And I hired, I hired a 17 year old kid um, when we were just starting out, like very, very early on. And I said, look, this is a monkey job and you're not a monkey. So your job is to automate your job as much as you can. Um, and so we started using, I think now we spend like $300 a month on Zapier. Um, we're using like 10,000 zaps every month at least. And every single step that can be automated has been automated. So Zapier does a lot. Christina does sales calls and sort of customer facing things. She's uh, an account manager whose job is to put out buyers when they go wrong and to talk to customers who are interested in our product. Um, and then there's a guy, Joel, who he runs billing and invoicing. So every Sunday he'll charge all the families run payroll for the tutors and make sure things are going well. And then there's another guy, Akshat, whose job is to sort of have projects. So it's like when I have an idea and I'm like, hey, we are gonna go and make blog posts for every SAT question explanation answer, then his job is to sort of do the legwork of making those blog posts and turning those ideas into action. What's the coolest thing you're doing in Zapier? I love Zapier. Oh. You, if you, I don't wanna put you on the spot because it might no, be no, another no, guy no, no, doing no, it. So much. I, really it, it runs the entire company. Like I think the most valuable thing we've built is, is a completely automated tutoring company in Xavier. Um, I think the first Zap that we ever built is probably the most important. So right now, one that we get is someone fills out the registration form. Uh, it's a Google form. And then that triggers a series of things. So the first thing is they get added to Google contacts, which then port over to my phone. So I now have their phone number, their email address. If someone calls me at 11 o'clock at night, I can say, hi, Francesca, how's it going? Um, so I have everyone's number built into Google contacts. Then we get an email draft. And so that email draft has the diagnostic test. It has all the pricing information, what we spoke about on the phone, uh, for their records. And that automatically gets, it goes over to drafts. We don't want to send it in case there's a sort of small changes, but it's easy to send out. Um, then they get added over to Airtable, where they sort of have, are able to easily be matched with the tutor. So we have all of their records in a database, easy to work and access. Um, they also got added to QuickBooks, so no one has to manually, like, I can't imagine running a business without Zapier because the idea that every customer who signs up, we'd have to spend two minutes adding them to QuickBooks seems uh, like agony to me. Um, so they get added to QuickBooks, they get their first invoice, 
um, and sort of every single part of this customer onboarding process that used to take me probably 30 to 40 minutes um, in the beginning, beginning now takes no time at all. I like that. I got some inspiration out of that. I'm going to totally yeah. see what else I can do with, uh, with Zapier. That's cool, man. Um, so, so 2020 big growth year, you have your, it sounds like you have your process in place. Like there's no, there's no challenge that you're facing that you're like, Oh man, like how did you, I guess, I guess the question is what, what do you iterate on in 2021? What do you focus on? So I think the business has four sort of four distinct units. So it's acquiring customers. Um, that's marketing. Then this question of like product quality, like our tutoring and making sure that scores are improving. Then there's sort of back office work of billing and invoicing and scheduling. And then this question of tutor acquisition, how do we find great tutors to be the supply side? Um, I think by far and away in this business that's competitive, um, there's always gonna be supply. It's, you know, Some companies really struggle to it, but I think because we're young, because I know what it's like to recruit in college and I know what it's like to, to be a smart person looking for a job, um, we've been able to do a good job of hiring and recruiting and attracting top quality tutors. Um, normally we'll accept sort of about one in every 10 applicants that we get and we only recruit at top schools like Princeton, Stanford, Harvard. Um, so that, I mean, if we ever get really big, we'll need to address that again, but that problem is, has been systematized pretty well. Um, billing and invoicing is a mess. Honestly, we use Qu QuickBooks. I think about 8% of invoices have some sort of a dispute or error. Either we're overcharging someone, we're undercharging someone, they don't understand their invoice. And QuickBooks doesn't have a customer portal. So there's no way that someone can log in and see their portal on QuickBooks. We started using a company Invoice Sherpa that allows a portal, but it's still ugly and not easy to use. Um, I would love to use Stripe, but because we time charge, Stripe's really good for a subscription service rather than a time charging service. And so, I mean, I'm not gonna build out a time charging software, but if anyone has a very good time charging software that has a customer portal so they can track their payments, that is a big problem area for us. I don't think it stops someone from recommending us and I don't think it stops someone from using us but I think it can turn customers who were neutral on us into enemies. And so a good example of this is I had a mom uh, accidentally get charged for a session and, and her immediate reaction is like, someone's trying to rip me off, right? Like, why is this person charging me $60? We stopped tutoring. I called her to explain the mistake. And she was like, she, you know, she wasn't happy about it, but she got off the phone. She's like, I'm skiing right now. Don't bother me. Um, yeah, she, you know, she, she didn't handle it nicely, but like, it's also our mistake. We made a mistake and we shouldn't. Um, and then a week later, she sent an even more threatening email because she actually got an on automated reminder for that invoice because it didn't get voided after the first mistake, right? And so it's like, that is a terrible problem. We have now turned a customer who maybe was neutral on us, right? Like we didn't have a great success. Like their daughters weren't great students, wasn't a great success, but they didn't hate us, right? And now they hate us. They think we have tried to lie from them and cheat them. And they think this because we have a bad billing system. Right. And so I think right. that's the number one reason we need to improve our billing system is it turns customers who didn't love us into enemies and no one should want an enemy. Accounting, man. Accounting. Accounting's tough. Um, and Accounting. then in terms of tutoring quality, I think right now we're recording video explanations to every single test. I think that is a chance to take a big weight off of our tutors. It's easier for homework for our students. Um, I think that's the biggest sort of push we're making right now. Um, it's definitely expensive though. Every you know, every one of those video recordings does cost a lot of money, and it doesn't generate any revenue. Um, short term, short term, short -term. Yeah. it's going to be. I mean, videos when you get SEO right on YouTube, it's a gold mine. And when you when you turn that SEO into written content, gold mine. I mean, you're seeing that already. Exactly. So the idea is, this is sort of an investment. It's a it's a gamble. It's a play. Uh, it's a bet. And so hopefully it'll work out. Maybe it won't. And then acquiring customers is really the number one challenge. And for this business always will be the number one challenge. Even the big players, it's their challenge too. So how can we, I think we have a really strong product offering. How, how are um, you acquiring customers? What's 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 been your focus there? Uh, you, I mean, uh, you said yeah. SEO, but I mean, paid media. Yeah, like local Google Maps, Craigslist was good for a while. We've started writing handwritten letters to every customer who signs up to ask for a referral. So that's been exciting. Um, and then now Facebook ads were a pretty good one for us. Uh, and then partnerships and sort of influence like online and then online influencers. Um, but I think we have this question of generally if someone gets on the phone with us, they're going to choose us. Um, like today, um, someone who was a previous like executive director of Kaplan ended up signing up for our test prep for their child. They thought we were the right fit. 
right? And uh, on average, we close about 80% of our sales calls. Um, so we generate quality leads and then those people choose us over the competition. So I think we have a strong offering. How can we communicate and get other people to know about SoFlow who are in market? How can we get in market people to know about SoFlow and get on the phone with us? Because I think if they got on the phone with us, they would choose us. And a lot of and a lot of the people you're talking to are intent based leads, right? A lot yeah, they're very much people who sought, actively sought out an SAT tutor, saw that we had great reviews, and then chose to give us a call. Yeah, it's a lot harder when you're reaching those folks who have casual interest. You got to spend more time turning them into a sale. Yeah, and so when I first started, I was really trying to skim the top of the cream and only get the the customers who had the most interest. And now as we scale, we have to sort of figure out how can we generate interest um, in this product. Yeah, I mean, it's just that it's just that incremental cost, right? Like you've, it's like in search, right? You max out all the people who are the most, the lowest hanging fruit, the folks who are expressing their interest for exactly what you do, their lower cost overall. Now you've got to expand and that next level of expansion is way expensive. And there's a whole different testing strategy that needs to go in to find the right creative and the message and the, the platforms that make that all work. That's a, that's a yeah. tough situation, but it's good because once you crack that, the rest of the le the levels of expansion kind of, you set the framework for how to do it. And so this is sort of, it's actually been a problem for me in the last month is we had built up a funnel that I thought worked really well with customers who are high intent. You get on the phone with us, you like us very quickly, you like us, we, you know, we talk about the product and then you're gonna sign up get started and you don't have to pay anything up front. So if you like us, you'll use us. And this model worked really well for customers of high intent. I'm, it didn't work super well on Facebook because I think of a passivity question or maybe a question of we did not generate and nurture the lead appropriately. So now I'm curious, I'm gonna tr we're gonna try YouTube ads and see if we can get sales on YouTube because maybe that'll be more intent-based. And if we're not able to get sales on YouTube, then I think we have to really rethink the model that we have to focus much more on nurturing than we currently are. So, so after a person um, submit, what, what, how many touch points does a consumer have before they share their information with you on Facebook? Really, one point. They have one twenty-minute phone call, uh, and then so prior to that, uh, prior, prior to them even signing up for the phone call, are they seeing one, one ad, two ads, ten ads? Oh, uh, in terms of ads. I'm honestly not totally sure. I think they're like generally. I don't. It, at least in Facebook Ads Manager, like our retargeting campaigns are definitely a lot smaller than our cold campaigns, and I think we haven't focused on retargeting a lot. I would say for the, most people, have seen one touch point with us. Maybe their friend mentioned us to them once. Maybe they've been on our website once, or maybe they've seen an ad once. I think right. most people have not had a strong like, don't know a ton about the company before they get on the phone. So one of the things that we've that that we found success in that we freely talk about in the marketplace is a three-step process. A three-step process is step one, ads that are engaging, very, very generic, very much a story and not much about anything to sell to sell to. The next step is ads that allow us to understand which creative, which message, which platform, which placement works the best for your particular brand. Then now the third step is now the third time the user is seeing between the, the third and the sixth time a user is seeing your ad. The sixth, the third through sixth step are basically ads that actually ask you to buy something or generate a lead. The benefit there is that you've tested with the relatively inexpensive ads, what works and what doesn't. Now I know which audiences, now I know which creative, and now I can actually just show the right ad to the right person and it's going to optimize a lot better over a longer period of time. That's so when I was asking about like how many touch points does a consumer have before they share their information with you, now those people are much more invested in who you are. You've built a, a little bit of a brand with them. You've built that no like and trust. And once mm -hmm. you've built that no like and trust, the whole sales process is a lot easier. The other part of it, which needs to happen certainly is that ongoing remarketing, that ongoing vying for the customer's interest, which really should be w what we're doing is about more touch points, more communication about who we are and why it's valuable and just a continued storytelling of the brand so that when we come and call you, 
like you're seeing our ads, you've shared your information with us. And now there's like between three and 10 different touch points over the course of months. And it's, it's a really great way of driving sales. Yeah. I think this idea of, like you said, sort of the first, like in the beginning, you can, you can grab the customer who's really interested, but nurturing those leads and encouraging sales over the course of months. So you find someone who's early in the funnel and get them to buy when they, when time is right for them. The next step, the next step I see some brands doing is taking that remarketing omni-channel. The remarketing occurs in search, the remarketing occurs on TikTok, the remarketing occurs with banners and online video and um, TikTok ads and, and, and more Facebook and Instagram ads. And that way at every consumer touch point, I'm seeing a reminder that I, that I have some particular interest in the brand and I see some brands doing that really well. But in order to do that, you gotta have a little bit of scale to access the minimum volume of users in each of those channels. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think you have to sort of, there's definitely some ad things where I've come across and just like, you need to be this big to enter. Yeah. YouTube is a great place. I'm looking forward to seeing how that how that works on, on YouTube. I, I think uh, it's such a robust platform. There's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, I think the thing that excites me the most about YouTube is that parents are on it. And so like when we've had influencers uh, that have come from YouTube, we actually generate parent leads. And as opposed to a lot of social media that's mostly dominated by teens, this is one where, you know, I see my dad, I see my girlfriend's dad just spending all day on YouTube every day. Uh, and so I think there's real potential for us to reach the parents who we want there. I think behavior has definitely shifted over the last nine months. I mean, I know I'm watching a ton more YouTube, even just as, you know, very anecdotally, just even while I'm working, I'm, um, I have something playing in the background, some live streamers going to different places. I have a two-year-old. And so basically now I'm watching like... Uh, people who walk around Disneyland in Florida or the magic kingdom in Florida. It's like, you know, you guys are walking around during a pandemic. That's, that's your, uh, that's your prerogative, but I enjoy Disneyland now cause I'm looking forward to it for, with my, with my two year old. That's um, amazing. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's like, I think there's a whole new, like YouTube as a, con as a contender, you know, when you think about video, you have Roku, you have Pluto, you have Tubi specifically just interested in the ad supported models or the ad supported platforms. Roku is, I mean, I think Roku is the primary platform for the home for connected television and, and content that has advertising in it. And YouTube, I think, is quickly becoming a contender in that space so well as well because of its more premium offerings and its ongoing live stream opportunities. So you might end up running your ad on a on a television uh, unintentionally, and it might be a great branding opportunity for you guys. Yeah, I, I think Roku is a great company. I think Roku was around for a long time finally got really lucky with just the idea of like, we're going to be the software that every smart TV runs on. But I think Roku is still a little clunky and they like, I think Roku should try and raise a bunch of money and just go after and try and make the best smart TV software in the world. Yeah. But it's good for ad space. I know, I know a lot of people are buying ad space on it. Yeah. So um, Adam, as we wrap up, how can people reach you if they want to talk to you about stuff, including tutoring? So the biggest thing is SoFlowTutors.com. Um, if you Google SoFlow SAT tutoring, we'll come up. Um, I'm happy to chat. I love meeting other entrepreneurs, other people in business. Um, I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship and happy to help anyone else sort of talk about my story and the things that I did to get where I am. And hopefully also thinking about where the future and learning from others who have come before me. I think it's interesting. You're, you're iterating very quickly. I think that's like probably, I mean, you're, you're clearly a smart dude, but beyond that, being able to iterate quickly is so key to success. I mean, our whole business is based off of iterating fast. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to build a Super Bowl commercial. I want to run a bunch of small ads and see which one works. And in order to do that effectively, you do a lot of, you need volume of content yeah. to make it work. And and just, I can see the way that you're, you're, you're running your business. There's so much quick iteration and testing happening. It's fantastic, man. I think there's this thing of, uh, there's this Y Combinator story where they came with like, they came with 20 ideas to the, to like the head guy. And they were like, what should we do? And he's like, I don't know, test them all. Um, and there's this idea of you need to test them all. And it takes work and it's hard, but the hard things are the things that pay off. So if you have 50 ideas and you know, it's hard to make 50 ad sets, but you have to do it if you want to be successful. If you make one and are like, this is my best ad set, that's not a, a winning yeah. method. It's not, it's not a Babe Ruth moment. Adam Shlomi. Thank you for being with us today. Founder of SoFlow SAT Tutoring. Wish you the best of luck and congratulations on all your success. Thank you very much, Robert.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.